Welcome back to this video on how to convert a tabular dataset into a graph dataset. Today we will have a look at how we can get a temporal graph dataset. So that's a graph that changes over time. Just like before, we continue with these seven steps to arrive at the dataset. And the additional part here now is that we need not only to find what are the nodes, the edges, the node features and the labels, but also what are the time steps. So that means how do you want to divide your graph into individual graphs or graphs that change over time. And most of the time this is not already defined. And because of that you have to divide it somehow, for example in 60 minute intervals. And the next thing is you need to find out what exactly is changing over time. So it might be that your nodes and edges are always the same and only the node labels change over time, for example in a traffic network. But it might also be that your edges change, you have more and less nodes for each time step. So there are different options and I discuss some examples below. For this video I have selected the New York City Bikers data set. That's simply a data set that contains bikers going from one to another location. And these locations already have IDs. So for example, this first biker with a specific ID went from start location 444 to end location 434. And the trip duration was around 700 seconds. And based on that, you can predict for other routes the trip duration or also use the structural information of neighboring nodes to find out how much traffic is going on at the moment. So this was just my idea when I saw this data set, maybe we could try this out. Just like before, we already have IDs for the locations, which is good because otherwise we would need to map this location into an ID because we uniquely want to identify one place. And later we have to remap these IDs again so that they start from zero. Because of that, we can use them as edge indices directly. After that, I drop some columns, which we don't need which are mainly the start and end station names because we already have these IDs. And I also drop columns that contain none values. And here is the mapping which I just mentioned. So I'll just reassign the start and end locations. So as you can see, now it's zero and previously it was 444. And with that, it's easier to uh, build the edges in the end. So what could we do with this data set? One possibility is to predict the trip durations between two locations based on the surrounding and temporal trip durations. So that means if there are a lot of bikers that take a very long time from one place to another place, it's very likely that there's a lot of traffic going on and we could predict how much time it takes from one place to another place. So the nodes in that case are the locations between which the bikers can travel and the node features are attributes about the location. Of course, we don't have features about these locations here, but we can simply calculate some statistics. For example, how many incoming and outgoing bikers do we have on average? We also don't have edges yet and the edges are typically defined between these locations and here we could use the latitude and longitude to calculate some sort of proximity between two locations and then we simply connect the locations that are close to each other. What would be even better for the street network is to connect the nodes according to how the road looks like. So if there is a road between two nodes then there will be an edge but we don't have this information here so we will just use the latitude and longitude. Now the trip durations are on one hand our label, because that's what we try to predict for the next graph. But on the other hand, they are also features of historical trips. So in a historical graph, we can use them as edge features between two nodes. And for future graphs, we can use them as labels. So basically the trip information is both the edge features and the labels. And this makes it a link prediction task. Now, the probably most challenging part is how do we define the step size from one graph to another graph? 
And here I just selected 60 minute steps. That means, so in our case, we, had, we have one month of data that ends up with around 70 graphs. And that means we have a snapshot of 60 minutes. And with that, we try to predict the next snapshot. As you can imagine, there are many ways to model all of this. And this is just a guidance to do it roughly. I'm pretty sure you will need to do adjustments here and there for your use case. Now, before we continue, I thought it makes sense to have a look at how many trips will fall into each of the 60-minute uh, intervals. Because this gives us a feeling on how granular our step size is selected. If we have too much data in one graph, it means that we probably should make the step size a bit smaller. But if there's only very few data points, it means that we need to increase it. So here I did that with a simple plot. I, I just loop over the data. So while start date smaller than end date, and then I just increment the start date by 60 minutes. And then I select how many trips, so from one location to another location, will fall into that time step bucket. And here we see that we have more or less 500 trips on average. And we also see some trends here. For example, the, the maximum number of trip increases over time. I guess that this data set comes from shortly before summer. And because of that, more and more bikers are on the streets the later in the month it gets. And also we can see these patterns. And obviously at night there are not many bike trips. So probably these lower areas represent the nights and the peak areas uh, sometime during the day. So this gives us a feeling on how many bikers are on the streets on average and how much information we have in each snapshot. We could also summarize the nights into one snapshot, for example, and things like that. So it's up to you to decide if there's enough information inside each time step bucket. So the next step is to extract the node features. And here the first difficulty begins. We have to figure out what are the changing components from graph to graph. Because based on that, we can pre-compute some parts of the graph only once. And the other things need to be calculated during a loop over the time. Because you need to extract in each time step the part of your data set that corresponds to this time step and then calculate all the features based on that. It turns out in our example, the node features are static, which means we can calculate them once in advance. And also the edges between the node features are static as well. So we have two static components and two dynamic components, which are the labels. So the, these trip durations and also the edge index between the labels. So I'll explain this more in detail in a second, but just a quick remark on dynamic graphs. That's a bit more difficult because if your nodes and especially the edge index change, that means that your edge index needs to be updated for each time step. And I've discussed some possible solutions how to handle that. But usually, if you have a static underlying graph and just your signals change, it's much, much easier than if your actual nodes or edges disappear or reappear in the graph. So as mentioned before, we don't really have node feature information about the locations here. And a simple solution I selected is to calculate how many outgoing trips and incoming trips a specific location has. And then I normalize these features between 0 and 1. Of course, if you have a train and test set, you should do these calculations only based on a train set. And because of that, you should apply a split here before. And this gives us node features of the shape number of nodes times number of features. And as I said, our number of nodes is static here. So it will always be these 300 locations. And we have two features which are normalized and represent the incoming and outgoing trips. The next part are the static edges. And as I said, we calculate the edges based on the distance uh, by latitude and longitude of the individual locations. 
And this is done by building a distance matrix that tells us the distance from lo one location to another location. And here I use a library called GeoPy and this provides a function to calculate the distance based on latitude and longitudes. And I do a simple apply on the data frame so that we get the distance between each of these um, start and end location pairs. And later I select a threshold, for example, 500 meters as cutoff. And all of the edges that are lower than that will be connected and all the other pairs are simply not connected. And this gives us an edge index that looks like this. So for example, location four is connected to 299 and the shape of that edge index is as always two times number of edges. So that is the static part of the edge index. And later I, when I tried to build the labels, I realized I will also need a dynamic part for the edges. And that's because the labels will become features for past time steps. And these features can of course only live on existing edges. The number of edges we have here needs to be the same number as edge features. Because of that, I will later extend this static list with some additional dynamic edges that change from snapshot to snapshot. And this might sound a little bit confusing at first, but I just suggest to have a look at the text I've written here, I've explained everything. And the thing is, I will need as many edge features as I have edges. And because of that, I will need to insert some dummies for these static edges. And here I decided to simply use the distance as edge feature, the edge type of that edge, which is zero for static here. And then the trip duration. And because we have no information here, we put in zero. And later for the dynamic edges, this trip duration will become a feature value and edge type is one because we have dynamic edges and we will put in um, a distance from the distance matrix we've built above. So now it's time to build the labels and that's the really temporal aspect of that data set because that's the number that changes over time. And because of that, we need to build them in a loop while looping over our data set. And what you have to remember is that we have this snapshot in a specific time step, but we want to predict the labels of the next snapshot because we want to predict how the trip durations for specific locations will be in the next time step. And because of that, we have that sort of offset or lag. So that means we take all of the information we have in the current time step and we take the labels from the next time step. And that's exactly what happens in that loop here. So we have a current snapshot, for example, zero to 60 minutes, and then subsequent snapshot, which is the one after that time interval. And the labels, which we can see here, come from this subsequent snapshot. And the way how most of the libraries expect our data is that we provide them lists with NumPy arrays. So the first, in, the first element in each of the lists is the first snapshot and so on. So this might look a little bit confusing at first, but actually it's pretty simple. We just loop over the start and end date of our time range and increment the start date. And then I select all of the trips that fall into this first snapshot and I use the stop time, so the end of the trip as cutoff because we don't want to have trips that start in the current snapshot but end in the next one. Uh, instead, we want all of the trips to be inside or end in, in the current um, time frame. And that's actually also a critical part because it might be that some of the trips occur in several time steps. Some bikers are around for several hours and that means we have to consider them in each of the snapshots. The next thing is that we might have multiple bikers on a trip between two locations. And here we just use the average of the trip durations. That means if we have 10 bikers on a road between two locations, we just 
take the average and use one value as label. As mentioned before, we then want to use the past labels as node features. And for that, we have to extend our edge index with additional edges so that we can use these features. And that's done in that function extract dynamic edges, which is up here. Here, we, I just extract the edges, so the um, location pairs for historical labels. And then I extend the edge index with a simple concatenate of the edge index and these additional indices and do the same for the edge features. And the last part is that I calculate the labels and those are simply the trip durations for all of the items in that subsequent snapshot. And in order to later calculate the loss or to select exactly those during prediction time, I also store the indices so that we know later, okay, model, please calculate the a prediction for those pairs uh, so that we can base the loss um, on the labels for which we have information. And the last step is simply to append everything to these lists. So the edge features, the edge indices, everything. And in the end, we have static edge features, static and dynamic edge indices and features, and dynamic labels, and also these label masks are dynamic. And one single data point might look like this. So the node features have that shape, and these are the shapes that change, and also the labels change. And because the edges are now in the end dynamic, because we have this dynamic component, we will need the dynamic graph temporal signal. And that means we pass in the edge indices, the edge features, the node features, the labels, and all additional arguments need to be passed as keyword arguments. That means they need to have a name. And for more information, simply have a look at the documentation. For example, static graph temporal signal expects NumPy arrays for edge index and edge weight, but a list of NumPy arrays for the features and the targets. And here we have lists for everything because everything is dynamic. So that's pretty much it. I hope this helps you to build a temporal graph data set. As you saw, it's not very straightforward to do that, but I guess if you follow the steps I've outlined here, you will end up with a good solution. And of course, let me know if you find any caveats or anything that will not work the way I described it here. And I will be happy to help you with that. And thanks for watching and see you soon in a future video.